morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started here, so if you guys could grab any beverages you'd like. We have coffee and tea and water in the back, um, and make your way to your seats. And if you're at home, you have all those in your fridge. Um, you're good. But hey, maybe next month, consider coming on out and joining us in person. I'm happy to supply you uh, with coffee and tea next month. Uh, welcome into the Civic Awareness Series. My name is Chris Corrigan. I'm a public programs coordinator here at Cantini Park. Um, and I am the, thank you. <laughs> and I am a proud partner with the League of Women Voters. I am so happy to be part of this program and part of this partnership. I joined them last year and helping continue Colonel McCormick's legacy of civic engagement. For those of you who don't know, Cantini Park is here because of Colonel Robert McCormick. He was the editor and president of the Chicago Tribune from 1910 till his death in 1955, and he is the founder of WGN Radio and WGN Television. Upon his passing, Colonel McCormick did not have any kids to leave his estate to, so he left it to us. It's like we're all Robert's children, a lovely gift to us. And in keeping with his legacy and the future he wanted, we're here today Day to talk about how we can keep our planet going in uh, one of the greenest ways possible. I don't want to take up any of our panelists' time. They have so little of it and so much information to share. But I do want to make sure that I share this information with our at-home audiences. You can see this on your screen now. This is not important for our in-person audience, but the presentation is beginning promptly at 7 p.m. Your microphones and cameras at home have been turned off, but don't you worry. If you have questions or comments or concerns, you can throw those in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And special for this Civic Awareness Series for our at-home viewers, you're going to find that you have some live experts who will be answering your questions throughout the presentation instead of addressing them at the end. So as those questions come into your head, please make sure you're utilizing that Q&A function to get your questions answered. We will probably pull a couple of them to answer live in this room as well but make sure that you're taking advantage of that function. You'll also see that the uh, closed captions feature is on. You're able to turn that on or off at your leisure as well. And now speaking of Q&A, for our in-person audience, we're handling Q&A a little bit differently this month as well for you guys. We have these wonderful students over here. Wave your hands loud. There we go. Everyone applaud them. They will be handing out cards for you guys to write questions down on. They'll give you little golf pencils, all that good stuff. And they will be collecting questions in between each panelist's presentation. So as a panelist is getting ready to sit back down, make sure you're passing your questions over to them so that they can go to our lovely questions moderator over here who will get them sorted and organized and make sure if there's any duplicates that we're not uh, repeating questions as well. So we'll be doing that throughout the evening. So make sure you're bubbling on those questions and preparing them as we go. I'm sure there's going to be many. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to the League of Women Voters to formally introduce tonight's panelist and presentation. So Catherine, why don't you come on up and get us started? Wow, terrific turnout. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Katherine Franzik, and I'm the environmental chair for the Wheaton League of Women Voters. We serve the cities of Carroll Stream, Warrenville, Winfield, West Chicago, Wheaton and Winfield. I think I've mixed them all up now. But anyway, but we're, in here, we're here tonight in partnership with the Glen Ellen and the leagues of DuPage County. So welcome. We are grateful this evening for the support from members of the Coalition for Plastic Reduction, Claudia Jackson sitting here, <laughs> Seema Kishev and Jordan Parker who on, are on Zoom to help monitor the online questions. Good. And as we said, we are really excited to have the Wheaton North Environmental Club led by instructor Lisa Smalls. They have, done, they have done an amazing amount of work pushing sustainability at their school, recycling water filter stations to pick, get water, fresh water. They've done things out in the community where they've cleaned up, but that's only a few of the things these students have taken on. So during the transition between speakers, the students, as, as Chris said, will come around and collect your, your questions. But right now, I'd like to introduce this evening's presenters and moderator. First, Jacqueline Kazaza. 
the president and co-founder of Go Green Glen Ellen, a nonprofit with a mission to help Glen Ellen residents and businesses be greener through education, advocacy, and volunteering. She serves on the Village of Glen Ellen Environmental Commission and the Glen Ellen Park District Resident Environment Advisory Board. <laughs> Second, Walter Willis, the Executive Director of the Solid Waste Agency of Lake County since 2007. Walter is responsible for overseeing the agency's solid waste and resource management programs. Prior to his current role, he worked in the waste industry as a consultant for approximately 20 years, and he assisted DuPage County in compiling their current five-year waste plan. Third, <laughs> third, Kay McKean, the founder and executive director of SCARES which stands for the School and Community Assistant for Re Assistance for Recycling and Composting Education. Kay has been recognized across our communities in Illinois for the effectiveness of her programs at SCARES and has developed and worked with legislations and has, which she has co-written to foster sustainability statewide. Thanks, Kay. <laughs> and fourth, Jen Walling, the Executive Director for the Illinois Environmental Council since January 2011. She oversees the strategic direction and management of the organization and lobbies decision makers on environmental issues. Jen is dedicated to building the power of our Illinois environmental community to secure policy outcomes that protect the environment. Our question moderator this evening. Oh, <laughs> Our question moderator this evening is Jenny Wooden. Jenny is the climate change reporter for the Daily Herald and is a core member with Report for America, a national service program that places journalists into, news, into local newsrooms to report on undercovered issues. And one more comment before, I, before we begin. Around the room there are eight by 10 posters with QR codes with links to the amazing organizations represented here tonight. These speakers and moderator are graciously giving of their time tonight, so please consider supporting their vital work as we dig into our topic, Plastic Pollution, Community Solutions. Jacqueline? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name again is Jacqueline Casaza. As the leader of Go Green Glen Ellen, a community nonprofit, I spend a lot of time learning about environmental issues like plastic pollution. And I'm excited to share some of this information with you tonight. You're going to hear a lot about plastic from all the presenters. So here are three key ideas I want you to keep in mind and take away from my presentation. Number one. Virtually every piece of plastic ever created is still on this earth. Number two, the chemicals that make plastic can make it harmful for our health. And number three, there is simply too much plastic to manage with recycling alone. We need to refuse and reduce this material in our lives. So what is plastic? Well, plastic is a polymer that contains various chemical additives to change its properties. This is the part of the presentation, by the way, where I show you cute pictures of my kids and talk about how wonderful plastic is before I get to some of the scary stuff. It's actually an incredibly versatile material. It's durable, it's lightweight, it's inexpensive to make, and it can take on any number of shapes and colors. All of these properties have made it very popular. Think about all the plastic now that we have that we didn't even use 15 or 20 years ago. Almost all food packaging pretty much every kid's toy in my house. And all, of our, all that clothing made from synthetic material that's all made from plastic. There's even plastic in chewing gum. So just how much plastic do we make? A lot. On this slide, I have several numbers that are almost too mind-boggling to comprehend. I cannot even visualize what is five trillion plastic bags, but that's how many we produce in a single year. So bottom line, we make a lot of plastic, and production is expected to double in the next 15 years. 
The biggest problem in my mind with the way we make plastic today is that about half of our plastic production is for single use products. Name anything else that you buy that you throw half of it away after using it once. We don't treat our clothing, our housewares, our cosmetics, or even food like that. This is a major design flaw with the way that we use plastic because, here comes the first key idea, virtually every piece of plastic ever produced still exists on Earth. So where is it? Where is all that plastic? Well, this big blob up on the screen uh, represents all the plastic that's ever been produced. So that kind of bottom blue bar, uh, that's about 30% of it, it's still in use. So if you think about, for example, the com plastic components on an airplane, um, you hope that those stay in use for a long time. That larger section above that represents the remaining 70%, that goes uh, eventually to the landfill. The landfill portion is represented in gray. Um, a small portion of plastic is burned. You can see kind of the smaller gray bar incinerated. I can't get into that this evening, but that presents its, its own environmental problems. And then the bottom green bar is the plastic that's recycled. And less than 9% of plastic is recycled. But keep in mind, when plastic is recycled, it has a short lifespan. So something like an aluminum can can be recycled infinitely. An aluminum can can become an aluminum can over and over again. But plastic is more often downcycled. So for example, a water bottle could become a piece of insulation or upcycled, it could become a pair of cute sunglasses. But I can't turn my cute sunglasses back into a water bottle and I can't turn my rug back into a water bottle. So those will eventually get thrown away. And that's again represented in the gray uh, landfill bar, recycled then discarded. So only that green loop that's recycled and still in use um, is plastic that's, that's been recycled uh, and still usable. So now we know that there's a tremendous amount of plastic in our world that is no longer in use. So what happens to all that plastic? Well, plastic, I'm going to illustrate this first with some more cute family photos. Uh, so here's my son Patrick with a straw he found helping me with a beach cleanup we did in Michigan. This was near our family lake house. So plastic does not biodegrade or break down. Um, instead, it breaks apart into small fragments when it's exposed to light, heat, and pressure over time. So you can see some examples of plastic fragments that we picked up on our beach cleanup. And uh, to the right, you can see the dime to illustrate the scale of just how small some of these fragments are. By the way, I challenge everyone that's listening to take a walk around your neighborhood tomorrow. Um, I guarantee you're going to find some fragment of plastic bottle cap, a candy wrapper, some plastic cutlery. I see it every single day walking around town. But at least being able to pick up these plastic fragments with my bare hand enabled us to capture them and put them in the trash. Um, but as plastic is, uh, con it continues to be exposed to the elements, it breaks down e even further. So now we move on to some not so cute and I think more downright scary photos of microplastics in our environment. Plastic gets to the point that it gets so small that it can be ingested by animals. Um, we've all seen these pictures and we eat animals, so that is a problem for us. Uh, as it gets smaller and smaller still, it can break down into our water and our soil. Microplastics have been found all over the globe. They've been found at the deepest trench of the ocean and in freshly fallen snow in Antarctica. And because of this pervasiveness, it's estimated that humans are consuming a credit card's worth of plastic a week, which is just gross. <laughs> um, but studies have found microplastics in the placentas of unborn babies, in human breast milk, in our blood, and in our lungs, irrespective of geographic location or socioeconomic status. It is truly a global problem. So remember in the beginning of the presentation, I said that plastic is a polymer with different chemical additives. And when that plastic breaks apart, whether it's in the environment or in our bodies, those chemical additives can be released. And here's my second key idea. The chemicals that make plastic, 
Well, didn't all come back through on the slide, but the chemicals that make plastic can make it harmful for our health. There are thousands of different chemicals, chemical additives in plastic, and very few of them have been tested. However, many of the ones that have been tested contain what are known as endocrine disruptors. These chemicals can mimic or confuse our endocrine system, which is what regulates our hormones. And almost every major organ in the body, like our brains, our hearts, kidneys, pancreas, and reproductive organs are regulated in part by our endocrine system. Endocrine disruptors have been linked with developmental, reproductive, neurological, and immunity dysfunction, and other problems like obesity and hormone-sensitive cancers. You may have heard of some of these endocrine disruptors like parabens, phthalates, PFAS, and probably one of the, um, some of the more famous ones which have been banned, um, BPA, and DDT. There they are. We don't like them. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, because people are, um, are typical, typically exposed to multiple endocrine disruptors at the same time, assessing individual health effects is difficult. These things are not just found in plastic, they're found in other things too. And I'm not a medical professional, and I'm not here to tell you that the takeout container you just ate from uh, on the way here is going to kill you. But <laughs> the research is clear and becoming clearer that endocrine disruptors are linked to a variety of health issues. All of us in this room probably know or have been impacted personally by things like infertility, miscarriage, ADHD, autism, or cancer. And because of these negative health impacts that I see as a mom and as a concerned member of my community, I wanna ask everyone listening tonight, do we think it might be worth re-examining our relationship with plastic? Plastic production has doubled in the last 15 years and is expected to double again in the next 15 years. We have never lived with this amount of plastic and this level of exposure to these chemicals before. We are the test case. The sheer volume of plastic that we are producing is too much and there is too much at stake with our health. Which brings me to my last key idea. There's simply too much plastic that's out there to manage with recycling alone we need to refuse and reduce the amount of this material in our lives. And the next speakers will begin to address some of that. Thank you. Am I ready? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Walter Willis. I'm a pleasure to be here. And the things I want to talk about today or tonight uh, are more focused on the recycling and what's going on with plastics recycling. Um, recycling is still cool, in my opinion. Uh, it's climate change is one, and to our agency is one of the key issues. And we, we wrote about it in our last plan update. And recycling can definitely have an, uh, an impact on reducing greenhouse gases, so it's very important to our agency. Uh, also, the circular economy concept. That's why I got the circle on my slides. Um, we adopted that in our last plan update as well, and that really ties to extended producer responsibility. Over the last 30 years, we've developed our recycling programs between local government and the waste industry. The producers, the people putting the packaging out there have been not in, engaged in the process. Well, that's changing. So that gets me really excited about the future of recycling. Here's the topics I'm gonna to go over. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the overview, but I do wanna tell you a little bit about our agency. I represent local government, so I have a different perspective on the issue. I am very concerned about the topic, obviously, and the impact it's having on people. Um, our agency is all about collecting materials, to be honest, diverting material from the landfill. That's really our main focus, and so our programs are Focused on that, we collect household chemicals. We have our own facility. We collect clothing and textiles. We're on board to make $100,000 a year collecting shoes and textiles through our drop-off boxes. Uh, we collect pharmaceuticals. We collect sharps. So we're all about giving access to our residents for programs. I mentioned the circular economy. Now, are we, you know, what are we doing to actually make a difference 
and create and move this circular economy. I told you the brand owners, the producers, the plastics industry obviously is very nervous now because of what is being said about their product and what it's doing to our planet. So they are trying to jump in as hard as they can to help. And I'm here to try to leverage that participation and improve our programs because I still think recycling plastic is very, very important so we don't get leakage out to the environment as, as little as we can. So the Great Lakes, uh, the Council of the Great Lakes Region, uh, bi-national organization, um, we're a knowledge partner with them. We are working uh, specifically on a very exciting boat film wrap. A lot of boaters will wrap their boat in the winter season with plastic. We've got about 1,500 boats that that plastic wrap will be recycled into new plastic wrap. They will be able to go wrap to wrap, and we hope that that program will continue to grow throughout the Great Lakes region. Uh, we're also working with the U University of Illinois Chicago. We're trying to collect film through the campus. This Great Lakes region, again, wants to take this pilot project with colleges and try to extrapolate it to all the colleges in the Great Lake region. So we're doing the pilot right here in Chicago at the U of I Chicago. Um, we're also MRFs, material recovery facilities where our recyclers go. They get a lot of film. People put a lot of film in their recycling still. So we call that incidental film. And they're unable to move that material right now because it's so contaminated. But we're working to try to create markets for that incidental film so that the MRFs can move that material because ultimately what we're looking to do possibly is bring f plastic film and pouch, because uh, there's so much film out there besides the plastic bag, into our curbside recycling programs. I know we've told you not to put that in there, but are we ever going to be able to pull enough through our retail network? Probably not. And film and pouches and that type of packaging material is growing, as you know, when you go to, the, go to shopping. So those are initiatives that we're trying to move the needle. That's what our agency tries to do. Um, we're also members of the U.S. Plastics Pact. Um, this was formed a couple of years ago. There's over 100 different entities. Again, a lot of the brand owners are engaged in this. Mars, Walmart, et cetera, waste industry uh, agencies like myself. And they've got some rather uh, ambitious goals. And one of them, the key one, or, or the four main ones, is this idea that the last sp uh, speaker talked about with single-use plastics. You simply need to get rid of those. And so there is a lot of thought about and going into what shouldn't be allowed anymore. And brand owners need to take note of that. And that's what the pact is trying to do. And then they've got the other ambitious goals to make it 100% reusable, recyclable, or compostable. So we'll have something to do with all of our packaging. We can either recycle it, compost it, or reuse it. We want to try to get to that place. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but that's where we want to be able to get to. And the uh, Recycling Partnership, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a lot of different big entities are behind this initiative. Canada has their own pact going on. Europe's done this. So it's really a way to try to get the entire supply chain working together. Status of plastics recycling. Um, <clears throat> Greenpeace recently had an article about re uh, recycling of plastics is really not occurring or put some question into that and um, one of the criteria that they use and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uses this is to be considered a recyclable material you have to recover over 30 percent over a population base of 400 million people which is basically Europe so if you're not capturing 30 percent of the material you're not considered a recyclable material under that definition so that confused some people because plastics is being recycled, the stuff that we put in our recycling cart, because it has great value, actually, to the, through the recycling facilities. So there is work to be done on the recovery, without a doubt. We recover much more cardboard and metal and aluminum than we do plastics. But one of the largest plastics recyclers in our country, KW Plastics, is basically saying, They've got demand horizons where post-consumer content, PCR they call it, um, is basically the brand owners in their, in, their, in their PET bottles, their water bottles, et cetera, are putting recycled content in there. And there's, there's laws being passed in New Jersey, Washington, California, 
basically mandating certain levels be met. We don't collect enough plastic to meet those PCR requirements that they're, we're putting into legislation. We simply don't collect enough. So what is the waste industry doing? Uh, are they legit? Is recycling really happening? I mean, I get this question a lot, and that kind of started our discussion with Catherine. Um, is there's confusion about it. People are confused, and they're, they're a little, I don't know, uh, apathetic. So our recycling numbers are stagnant. Um, but it's happening because waste management uh, is integrating themselves into downstream manufacturing facilities where they are going to have to recover more film for this company they just built, Natura PCR, it's a plastic film recycler. Well, they need to feed that facility, and we're trying to collect film. So they are integrating into collecting film and actually doing something with the film. 9% um, of their revenue is tied to recycling. So it's a serious business. All of our hauling contracts in Lake County, they can't throw recyclables away. That would be a violation of the contract. They would have to alert us to that fact. Some of that was going on with uh, uh, the uh, Chinese sword, where basically they stopped accepting our mixed plastics and a lot of our fiber. Um, we've recovered from that. Most of our material, over 80% of our material recycle is handled domestically. It's not exported. Republic is building what we call PERFs, or plastics recovery facilities. They will take the bales of plastic, they won't separate it at their major, major MRF, they'll send it downstream to another facility to further break out the plastics and then get it to a flake so they can go back into plastics manufacturing. So we're seeing significant investments by the waste industry in plastics recycling. I'm going to go over this really quick because I, I think we're getting a little behind, but uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited uh, about recycling is the, the opportunity to pass extended producer responsibility for packaging and paper products. I'm working with IEC on this bill. It's a very complicated and huge paradigm shift. Basically what it means is every, every single family home and multifamily home in the entire state of Illinois would have access to recycling and we'd have good education programs. So we wouldn't have these deserts out there. It would shift the cost from the rate payer. We all pay about $8 a household a month for that recycling truck to drive by our home. It would shift that cost to the, the brand owners and the packaging or the companies that are actually selling us products and the packaging that they're using. So that we get it into their balance sheet. They will change their behavior and make packaging more recyclable, more easily recyclable, so that we can do the circular economy with that concept. Um, so it also would, would extend to all schools and government buildings and open spaces would have access to recycling. So it would greatly expand recycling and we'd be able to recover more plastics. We do have a requirement in the bill that much like New Jersey and other states did, they put requirements that you have to put so much recycled plastic into your new packaging that's in this bill as well. That will create demand for the plastic that gets recycled so that we can create that circular economy and get it out of the environment. Um, we also are working with IEC on most of the EPR packaging laws that have been passed in the, in the, in the world. There's over 30 countries were done decades ago and it was mainly focused on recycling. Now uh, the environmental groups are looking at these pieces of legislation as a way to force changes in packaging from the get-go. Create less packaging and make it more reusable, refillable, and move towards that type of situation as opposed to just relying on recycling and composting it all. So that's something we're also very uh, willing to work on uh, on this bill. Um, so we think that something like this would, would really uh, increase the amount of plastics that we're recovering and deal with the, the litter issue that we do have with plastics. So I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. Okay. 
Well, hi, everybody. My name is Kay, and I'm really excited to be here today. Hi, Kristen. Uh, <laughs> plastic recycling challenges, and my goodness, there are very, very many. Um, and we'll try to cover some of those really quickly today. Um, but plastic is something that we all use, and there's some very quick and easy things we can do to prevent the amount of plastic that we're using. And we've got a table over there with some exciting things to look at, I think exciting. Um, so I have been the founder of Scarce, it's now 32 years old. I've served on the City of Wheaton's Environmental Commission since 1984. I'm the longest serving and probably the oldest. Uh, <laughs> and I was lucky to serve with Walter on the Illinois Materials Management Advisory Committee for the state of Illinois for 18 months, where we looked at problems and solutions across the state. So here's what it looks like when you're recycling trucks and leave your neighborhood and go to the sorting facility. This is the sorting facility in Elk Grove. And Jacqueline and Catherine and I were just there in February together. That's a lot. They're sorting 600 to 800 tons a day. Look at that mountain, you guys. Okay? It's very, very incredible. And then when you think about it, you put stuff at the curb in your recycling bin. And hopefully people know now that styrofoam doesn't go in your recycling bin. So the first bin is a styrofoam cooler, a laundry basket, because that's ever been on a list, ever, never. And inside the laundry basket is a plastic bag of maybe recyclables, maybe garbage, right? In the second one, there is a two-shelf bookcase, a wicker basket, an un unflattened cardboard box, and in the last one, you can't really tell which one is the recycling bin. The recycling bin is the one on your left. Um, it has a powder blue lid, so a little bit different color lid, but the bags are there. They did flatten the cardboard, but the bags are there. You saw that big pile of recyclables, right? Do you think anybody with 600 tons of recyclables coming through on a conveyor is going to stand there and open up your plastic bag and shake out your recyclables. It cannot happen. So the first thing, please don't buy plastic bags to put your recyclables, right, into the plastic bags. <laughs> You're buying more plastic and um, creating a problem. Everything you put in a plastic bag at your recycling bin will go in the garbage, every single one. We watched it happen. So empty them loosely in your cart if that's what you want to use as a bag at your house. This picture, do you see the guy on your left, that plastic bag? That was full of recyclables. He just took it, and that chute sends it right down to the garbage dumpster. There is no time, you guys. There are 300 conveyor belts in this facility. There is no time to rip open a plastic bag. Look at the contaminants. There's plastic everywhere. That's a mountain. The number of picks these folks are supposed to do in a minute is 90. You all saw I Love Lucy in the Chocolate Factory. 90 picks a minute in that mountain. Let's get real, okay? This is what the plastic looks like as it clogs the conveyors. So on the top left is what those rollers look like when they start a shift. Within two hours, this is what the rollers look like. Your plastic bags, your bubble wrap, your um, ribbons, your cords that people put into the recycling bins, right? Tangle, 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 close, all those things. Look at this machine. They have to turn off all 300 conveyors so they can climb in on those rollers with razor knives and pliers and pull out the plastic so they can start again. It's quite alarming. We've got to do better. So, Jewel, um, Target, where are the places? You go to those stores anyway. Bring your plastic bags, bring your plastic bags, bring your bubble wrap. Um, there are different kinds of plastic, but there is a website um, for plastic bag recycling and film recycling. It needs to be empty and dry. So we have a problem that people use plastic bags in their car and they change a kid's diaper and then they put the plastic bag with the dirty diaper in the grocery bin collection for plastic bags. Do you guys remember when you used to go into the store with your plastic bags and now it's all in between the two glass doors? The health department was going to shut us down here in Downers Grove for so many people bringing dirty diapers into Dominic's 
in their plastic bags. So we worked with them and they put the, the plastic bag collection bins now between the two glass doors so it doesn't actually come into the grocery store. Kohl's had to move their plastic bag collection bin to back by customer service because they're pretty sure we're not bold enough to carry our garbage all the way from in the beginning of the store all the way back to customer service because that's what we were doing. People were just bringing their garbage and filling the bin. Whole Foods quit taking all kinds of plastics because people just brought their garbage to put in their collection bins. The sheer amount of plastic that Jacqueline was talking about, how are we going to sort it? There are so many kinds of plastics. Nice colors, sort of, right? Wish cycling. Oh, I'll let them figure it out. They probably know if it's recyclable. I'll put it in, they'll figure it out. And that's 600 tons? Yeah, right. So when in doubt, keep it out, find out, call us. Plastic lids, you've probably learned plastic lids on your bottles, plastic lids off your bottles, right? Which is it? Plastic lids on your bottles, okay? Then they're not loose. Where are you going to pick up all those little plastic lids in that huge pile? So as a plastic container, plastic lids stay on top. Glass containers, no lids. The plastics that are truly being recycled according to the facility that we all visited, one, twos, and fives. That's it. There aren't any food containers number three. There are very few food containers in number four. Sixes and sevens, of course, are a huge problem. So plastic lids on, except you see that little X over there? That's on those spray bottles and those nozzles. No nozzles, OK? Regular lids, we can put those in. Empty and clean. Um, so no salad, no forks. Forks are not recyclable. Yes, they're plastic, but they are not recyclable. Water bottles, pop bottles, empty it before you send it along. And spatula clean, that peanut butter jar is just fine. Spatula clean. If you use a spatula, you probably get another whole sandwich out of it. Um, and you'll <laughs> save some money and you'll clean it up good enough, right? But you're going to put the lid on it as well, right? Um, none of these go in your recycling bin. None of these. All right, there's a display over there. So if it's three inches or under three gallons is what we learned, right? These are gross and unsafe. So many battery fires, we've learned about that, but plastic syringes. Styrofoam full of food and a plastic fork. Dirty diapers. In fact, one we, call the hall, we call the sorting facilities about twice a year. What's the worst thing that's coming in? Please tell people no dirty diapers in the recycling bin, all right? So gross for sure. None of these are recyclable. Garden season is coming. Your planter pots will have a triangle on them and a number, but they're not recyclable. None of them. Some stores say they take them back, but you have to make sure that when you take them back that they're really getting picked up and recycled or reused. No tubes of any kind can go into your recycling bin. No plastic hangers. Basically, you should think of yourself as a container. A container is what can go into your recycling bin. No pizza, little Barbie tables, OK? So we've really come up with a bunch of different R's. But as Jacqueline said, refuse. Don't bring it home, right? Don't buy it. Write the company on your email and say, I'm not buying your product. I like your product. But it is just too much packaging. Mail it back to them and say, I'm never buying this again, right? We can do, do, we can do a lot better. Reducing what we use. Reuse as much as we can. But when we reuse plastics, those nanoparticles are still coming off in the water, right? That is not the best answer. Repairing things as best we can, composting as much, many of you know that that's my big passion, and then recycling. Recycling should be the last resort, all right? Reuse, don't buy it, is first. Thanks, you guys. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to Plastic Springfield and your community. We've talked all about tonight about um, the issues behind plastics, the health impacts, the ways that they're impacting the environment, possible policy changes. Um, I want to talk about things that are, um, 
oops, under consideration in Springfield um, and what you can do about it. And you know, we've learned a lot about different, different policies, different things you can do, um, but I will put forward, we have a political problem that we need to solve um, in order to get the, our, our policy done. We don't have a policy problem, we know how to solve these problems, um, but we need to have the politics that enables us to do it. So uh, League of Women Voters, key to all of that to make sure that we can solve these problems. Um, so just a little, Illinois Environmental Council is an organization um, that has, we have a C3 and a C4 organization, and we have um, over 100 different environmental organizations that are uh, members of ours, including Scarce and Swalco are some of our members. We're a member of the um, Coalition for Plastic Reduction, um, and we work in a lot of different coalitions with a lot of different people. Um, we mainly work on lobbying at the state level. We do a little bit of city of Chicago and federal lobbying. I'd love to someday do a lot more local lobbying in local communities, but that's not where our capacity is at this point. But we've done um, Springfield lobbying forever. I'm a registered lobbyist with the state of Illinois. So I'm gonna go through some of the bills that are under consideration right now um, and end with a call to action of all of you. So one piece I wanna start with that we haven't talked a lot about tonight is the impact of plastics and of recycling and waste infrastructure on environmental justice communities. These are communities where there's typically low income people of color um, or people who are otherwise burdened um, by lots of pollution or vulnerable populations such as people under, uh, children under five years old or the elderly. So all of these folks um, can be in environmental justice populations. There's a, a map that you can look at as to where those communities might be. And as we do this, and especially if we're going to expand recycling um, infrastructure, if we're going to expand that sort of thing, we need to look at the way that these are impacting environmental justice communities um, and making sure we're not adding to that burden on these communities. We do have another bill. I'm starting with House Bill 2520, which is about air permitting in environmental justice communities to make sure that we're not increasing that burden. But that's a piece we all need to look at. Um, I think many of you have heard about the General Iron facility that moved, wanted to move from kind of white, wealthy Lincoln Park to the southeast side that's more of a middle class neighborhood. Um, and that was a recycler. That was somebody who wanted to recycle um, metals, recycle cars, that sort of thing. And it was something that we strongly opposed because they had been violating the law in one community and wanted to go to a community with even less power um, where they could continue to have environmental compliance issues. So environmental justice is really important. But here are a ton of different bills, and I'm just gonna kinda, this is gonna be the bulk of my presentation. I'm gonna go through the bills that are in Springfield um, that we have put forward, and these are all the ones that are moving, which is exciting. Um, I wanna start out with the one that's not at the top, which I'm gonna call to action at the end, which we are very excited to have the foam foodware ban, House Bill 2376. Um, very excited, has moved out of, uh, and with Coalition for Plastic Reduction, I see a lot of leaders in this room, um, that bill has moved out of the Illinois House for the first time. Um, just really resounding vote, and it's over in the Illinois Senate, and we need to get them to move it forward, move it into the Environment Committee, um, move the bill towards passage. It's an incredibly important bill, and that is the one we most want to get done this year, because if we don't have that styrofoam in that system, especially food, foam foodware, which is often contaminated, you know, these recyclers even of styrofoam don't want contaminated styrofoam. Let's just not make it. Um, and so, um, you know, this will uh, ban the sale in, uh, ban restaurants and retailers from giving it away. So, um, that one, House Bill 2376, uh, but also the state of Illinois needs to lead the way. Last year, we banned single-use plastics at st from from being purchased by DNR for state parks. So that's an exciting piece. It took effect for the DNR itself January 1st, and it'll take effect for vendors next year. So we can see a ban on those single-use plastics at those facilities. Um, Reuse, incredibly important as well. I've been working on ways that we can get more people to use consumer-owned containers forever. And this year, we've copied a bill from California about bring your own container, um, which is House Bill 2086. And this is a bill that creates health standards for restaurants to allow people to use their own container. 
They don't, you know, it's not going to require a restaurant. You can't barge into a restaurant and demand they use your container, but you could give them the sheet about guidelines that can be used at a restaurant. And maybe if they can meet those guidelines, they're going to feel a little more comfortable you know, and this isn't just like taking your, you know, to go after you've ate at a sit down restaurant. It's really about even giving them your own container to package food behind the counter. Um, so creating health standards so it can be done safely is um, an exciting piece. So we have that one. We have a few on composting. I won't cover those since we're doing plastics tonight. Another one I'm super pumped about, and I'm actually, I didn't think we were going to get this done in one year, and I, fingers crossed, but I got it through the Senate, which is the harder chamber. Uh, but you see everybody's got our refilled um, bottle refills. Uh, we put in a bill that was modeled after Washington State to require all drinking fountains installed after 2026 to have a bottle refill station if it's in a place that's required, which is most public spaces, there's a requirement. So we will require those bottle refilling stations, which is great not only for plastics, but for um, sanitation. They're much more sanitary um, and everybody needs water. So that one is a really exciting bill. Um, and like I said, almost unanimous from the Senate, and we'll go over to the House. It'll be really exciting there. Um, there is a bottle bill that is in the works, Senate Bill 85. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of bottle bills in a second, but we're spending a lot of work on that one. And then um, there is a bill about a study on microplastics in drinking water. And we've been opposing a bill about chemical recycling. One of the things we haven't talked a lot about tonight is that there are a lot of places that are looking at chemical recycling. And um, there's the part where you may turn it with chemicals into something else, which is extremely toxic. But often, in addition to turning that into another product, you're creating fuel out of plastics, because it is oil. Um, but then you know, you'd create a fuel, and you burn it, and that has all sorts of toxic chemicals in it. There's a ProPublica article that says that certain types of um, sustainable fuels made from these plastics give a one in four cancer risk to the people exposed to it. It's extremely toxic. Um, and there's one of these proposed for the Will County area and um, just not great. And there's a lot of other places, you know, Walter talked about the need for plastics, but let's not burn them. Um, we need to get away from fossil fuels, not create more fossil fuels. So um, actually, I'm going to skip some of the bottle bill. Um, just with timing, you know, we're also um, thinking a lot about extended producer responsibility, and I wanted to give some of the things that we're thinking about as a coalition. Um, we're really pumped about the idea of extended producer responsibility, and we've supported it with electronic waste. We've also supported it with um, uh, prescription drugs, which is a bill that passed last year. We're really looking for this bill to have a lot on reduction and making sure that companies especially reduce the amount of plastic waste they're creating. We're also really looking at environmental justice concerns. If we're going to do more recycling, we can't put more recycling facilities in areas that are already overburdened by pollution. Um, and then also making sure a lot of communities, you know, I've gone to like East St. Louis, and the folks that I have talked to there have said um, one of the ways the packaging industry has impacted them is litter, and their communities don't have the resource to go pick up litter. So how do we make sure that those communities have the same resources that others do to deal with this pollution and blight that has impacted where they are? Um, and of course, prohibiting chemical recycling. And then we're really looking towards oversight of the program from producer responsibility organizations, um, making sure that everybody that creates waste is involved in the outcomes. So those are some things that we're looking at consideration, but it's an exciting idea. We really want to make sure it's done well and we're a leader in Illinois. I'm going to go through just like these are some policy ideas that are out there. I only have a couple more minutes. So I want to talk about some things that are out there and that you can think about too. Um, and actually, uh, I'm going to, you know, plastic bag taxes. Um, this is something that a few communities have done. I'll go back to that slide in a second. Um, we're working from a perspective of, you know, we should ban plastic bags. Um, the state of New Jersey doesn't allow any carryout bags whatsoever, for example. Um, but let's ban plastic bags. And then, you know, it, whether it's a tax on paper bags or a fee on paper bags, if we need to do the policy that way. But 
you know, we're finding like city of Chicago put a tax on plastic bags and now they really like the $7 million that's coming in every year and they're not spending that on environmental causes, they're spending that on pensions and they don't wanna give that up. Um, so they have no impetus to decrease the amount of plastic bags that they're using um, and it definitely went up during the pandemic. The amount of plastic bags went down by a huge amount up front. Um, but, you know, through the pandemic, people got used to paying it. It's actually not that much money now, especially when you look at your overall grocery bill. Um, and so plastic bag bans is more what we're looking at. Um, I put one interesting thing here. I want you to give due consideration. You know, we think a lot about allyship in the environmental community, and we don't support plastic straw bans. A lot of people in the disability community have brought up to us how necessary plastic straws are. And I know some of you may be thinking, but they can use, no. No, we don't, the disability community has told us that these are things that they need to consume food. And plastic straws are not the source of the plastic problem. All these big corporations that are creating all this plastic are the issue. Um, so those are things that we don't like to see. When we've written bills in the past, we like to do all single-use plastics by request only, but we've worked with the disability community on straws being available by request. Um, and not a disability test. Um, you know, we just need to support uh, other communities when we're doing this and making sure that we're not um, further oppressing people who are oppressed in our society. So that's something that we're thinking about a lot. Um, PFAS reduction, perfluoroalkyl substances, we've talked about. There were nine bills introduced in the Illinois General Assembly alone to reduce the source of PFAS. Um, there's a balloon release ban that's been stalled this year, but I want to get that one done. And there was a, some innovative stuff, um, a closed washer microplastics filter requirement. The microplastics are in your clothes. So, um, and then, you know, we have a very strong ordinance we introduced in Chicago that unfortunately didn't pass. And unfortunately, the ordinance that did pass on delivery had no enforcement mechanism. So it's something that we still need to work on. Um, but I want to end with this, and this is, I'm, I'm at my 10 minutes, I'm happy to take questions with everybody. Um, but I'm putting this up, and you can all, right now, everybody can take out their smartphone. Um, I can see you and what you're doing here. Um, and you should be able to access this QR code, um, which will take you to an action alert um, to write to your lawmaker to support the styrofoam ban. So, you know, just open up your phone and kind of click on the QR code. It'll take you to the link. If it's not working, islandviral.org, our action center, and tell your lawmaker right now that you want to ban foam foodware. Um, this is really important. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll end, well, I'm gonna show you one more thing, but I'll come back to this just in case you need a little more time to do the QR code. Um, we also have a lobby day coming up next week on Wednesday. Um, I know there's a bus in Oak Park. I'm thinking about whether there's a bus in DuPage, but Naperville, you can get on the bus in Naperville. We have 400 people coming, and you can be one of those people that come down to Springfield to work not only on the plastic foam ban, but on other bills, and just tell your lawmaker they need to support climate action right now. So um, I hope that you'll come and you'll join us, and I hope that you will take action tonight to um, ban foam foodware. So I'm gonna leave that up and, and uh, take questions, so thank you. Okay, hello. As we're collecting questions, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started to try and save time. Um, uh, sorry, you guys, this <laughs> is like a line of sight. I can stand, actually. I've got all the questions like um, spread out here. Thank you guys so much, and thank you to League of Women Voters for having me. This is really great, and we're gonna try to squeeze as many of your questions as we can. Um, I'm gonna start with kind of a simple one that we got too, asking what is plastic film? Um, so I thought that was interesting that we got two of those. Um, and then a secondary to that is, if these recyclables are reused, does that just increase the chemical impact on humans. So that might be a good one for um, Walter, as I know that you mentioned that we're doing some film recycling um, around the boats. Um, but yeah, take it away. 
All right, so plastic film, um, it's plastic bags is a good way to think of it, but it's any of the kind of, I'm doing this, even though I don't have plastic film in my hand. <laughs> it's uh, things that, like, for example, your like paper towels would come in it, or um, like things that, like shrink wrapping around packaging, that's plastic film. Um, but also bubble wrap and um, some plastic mailers, that's also considered plastic film. I'll leave it any out. Okay. And what was the second part? The second, oh. Okay. The second part was if these, if plastic film is able to be recycled, um, does that just increase the chemical impact on humans? So maybe it's a question about, you know, a particular, um, maybe a potential byproduct of that recycling process? Yeah. I mean, um, so when you're looking at plastic recycling, you're typically looking at a mechanical or heat process. Um, for most of it, there's there's also chemical recycling, which also can be extremely toxic. Um, but a lot of plastics, when it's done, it's it's mechanical or heat, and that's a lot of reason that some of the plastics can't be um, reused in food because it's not heated high enough to end up being part of a food product. And I will, you know, take a look at the science of of plastics yourselves. I think the biggest risk in plastics is the toxic materials that are being used to create it and the toxins that are used when you're doing chemical recycling. I do think there is some really strong science on things like um, styrofoam, especially when you heat it up, which you are not supposed to do that is actually a thing and it doesn't say it on there. You're not supposed to heat up styrofoam with your food in it. Not only will it melt on your food, but it has things that it releases. Um, but I think, I think that piece is pretty strong. I think some of the evidence of um, the health risks from use and reuse of pl plastics is still up in the air, but you may want to be somebody that uses caution. And we know that glass, we know that metal, um, you know, you, you might get, um, like if you're using a cast iron pan, you might get iron in your food, but it's, it could be good, right? Um, it's good for you. <laughs> um, but you know, that, that might be something that you're going to use caution. Um, but I, I don't feel that strongly about the science, and I reuse plastic myself um, really often. But my biggest concern is the risk in the creation and in chemical recycling. But I'll hand it to Walter, too. Well, just real quick, um, most of the plastic film, which has been explained, is used to make plastic lumber. So Trex is a huge buyer from the retail outlets that we get, and another big buyer is the plastic film industry itself, which goes plastic bag to plastic bag. So those are the two primary uses for the film that we divert. And after hearing all of that, I still really worry about the tiny, tiny nanoparticles that then we breathe in and drink in our water. That I, I think we cannot deny those tiny particles. There are trillions of them, in right, in small pieces. And who knows the chemicals? I think we have enough evidence to say we don't want to be eating plastics. We don't want it in our lungs. Well, that is a great segue. Um, we have gotten a few questions about microplastics, so I'm going to kind of give you guys two. One is a yes or no. Are there microplastics in our drinking water? And two, is there a way to individually or as a community get microplastics out of our water and food? So the most recent study I read is the number one way to drink your plastics is out of a plastic water bottle. The second way to get the most plastic is to get water out of your tap. And there are water filters, um, reverse osmosis. Um, there are a lot of companies working on trying to capture those tiny nanoparticles, but how small are nanoparticles, right? Um, it's, it's concerning. Okay, and then we have some questions um, kind of about how much we're exporting. Um, so I know, Walter, you alluded to this. You know, there's been a difference in terms of now there being 80% of our um, recycling being done domestically. So I think people just wanted some context on that. So there is a question. Before we stopped exporting our plastics, how much was exported? And what changes have we now seen um, because of it? Um, so, you know, there is a similar question about, you know, what kinds of plastics are really being recycled? Um, some people have been seeing some information about our plastic being sent to Asia. Um, so if you can kind of clear those up. 
Sure. Uh, most of the MRFs will make several bales. They'll make a, a number one plastic, which is your soda bottles. They'll make a number two, which is your high-density polyethylene, which is your milk jugs. So that's a natural. And they make a colored one, which is your detergent bottle. So they make those three different bales, and they make a number five bale, which is polypropylene, like your French onion dip container, et cetera. Um, all those have good markets domestically for the most part. That KW Plastics company I listed is, is one of the major buyers. And um, the mixed bale, so the, that's a, another bale that a lot of MRFs would make. That's the, the threes. So there's not a lot of PVC packaging, as Kay mentioned. Number six is your styrene. So you do see that. Not only can styrofoam be like the light stuff, but it can look like a rigid, too. It can confuse you. So that those bales would typically be, get, be sent overseas. And a lot of our mixed plastics is still sent, but not to China. Um, Vietnam and other countries like that have, have definitely become buyers of it. So I'm not saying we don't export any plastics. but uh, um, And on the fiber side, we've got a lot of mill capacity in our own country. So we don't really export fiber. Um, I thought this was interesting. Does it reduce the likelihood of passage to have so many different environmental builds? Um, so maybe you can comment on that. I was also curious, yeah, about just like the general success of having so many um, builds. Yeah, I mean, definitely there can be a place where a lawmaker can be like, I told you yes on this, but I told you no on that. But, um, you know, I do find that um, in Springfield... You know, some people worry about like, oh, doing just this tiny thing at a time. But I find when you do something small, um, you know, lawmakers are nervous. They want to see what the impact is going to be back home and who's going to be mad at them and who's going to be like, thank you, thank you. Um, and so they like to do small things. And then they go back home and they realize, oh, this went really well for me. And then they're going to do more and more and more. I've not really seen any area in the environment in the last, you know, 15 years that I've been working on this, that it's gone backwards. Um, you know, it just keeps going more and more, and they're more and more comfortable voting for good things. Um, I think we need, we're, we're kind of going in a different direction now with reduction in terms of the waste industry than Illinois has gone in the past. So this is a new thing for them to vote on. But um, I don't know, I also have a strategy of putting in a lot of different policies um, because it gives different lawmakers the ability to be champions on different ones. Uh, but, you know, that being said, we do choose priorities. So not all of those bills that I put up, in fact, the only one on our lobby day agenda where we're going to have 400 people is our uh, foam foodware ban. And that is the one that we're focusing grassroots action that we're working on. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm strategic about this stuff. I got some strategy and I'm... <laughs> somewhat successful on it so <laughs> okay I was told we only have time for one but I'm gonna sneak in one really quick because I think it's important do we have a solid waste agency of DuPage County so we don't have what Walter has <laughs> I've always been jealous um, but we do have a solid waste plan and we do have a solid waste um, environmental plan where is Sheila Rutledge Sheila, stand up. Would you like to answer that question? Sheila, you guys, is Sheila Rutledge. She's chairman of the DuPage County Environmental Committee. And she has been working tirelessly on getting rid of styrofoam throughout the county facilities. So go ahead, Sheila. Why don't you answer that question? Well, we have Walter. Uh. Um, so yes, we do not have that type of an agency. But um, Walter has been very generous with his time and helped me do uh, several things at the county. Um, I have been pressing to get rid of foam, at least on the county complex. Uh, I didn't get much traction. So thank you very much to the state of Illinois for running with that. Uh, one of the other things that I want to point out that I really love seeing was uh, the balloon release ban. Um, I don't get any traction on that either. Uh, so, you know, th th I can press my ideas, but um, it takes a village, and sometimes I can't always make those things happen. The other thing, if you're, how many of you live in an unincorporated area? Oh, not too many, okay. Um, I live in an unincorporated area. I have four trash days on my street and six companies that service my uh, street. So uh, that's, that's the really one big thing that I'm pushing right now is to uh, get a single trash hauler contract within each township. 
Uh, it's a big lift, so support me if you can. Uh, but I'll turn this back over. Okay, we just have one more. I, there are so many good questions that I wish we could answer, um, but we're gonna end on one that kind of is about sharing resources and how we can utilize our, our um, community members and our organizations. So this one is, as a teacher, how can I best use scarce resources? Call, is this on? Call me. <laughs> Call me, I will go anywhere. I talk trash all day. Walter just said to me, she never quits. I don't quit. I might be old, but I don't quit. Um, call me, I will go anywhere and talk to kids and talk to teachers. I will go anywhere and I'm delighted to and eager to, so call me. <laughs> I'll talk trash with you any day. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> wasn't this great? Let's give another round of applause, please. And I just want to say one thing. I knew my Barbie car is still in there somewhere. <laughs> That's frightening. So a big thank you to our panelists tonight, Jacqueline Kazaza from Go Green Glen Ellen, Kay McKean from Scares, Jen Walling from Illinois Environmental Council, and Walter Willis, Solid Waste Agency of Lake County, and of course, to our moderator, um, Jenny Whitten from the Daily Herald. Thank you so much. Um, we're grateful that you spent the evening with us. And so unfortunately, plastic is a part of our lives, although please remember the steps that you can take to help reduce single-use plastic. Bring your own bags whenever you shop, Bring an extra produce bag when you go to the grocery store. Take reusable beverage containers with you to use them. And don't bring, or don't bag your recyclables for your recycling bin. That drives me crazy when I walk our neighborhoods. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, so many things drive me crazy. No. <laughs> and um, thank you to our audience um, for joining us tonight. We appreciate your questions and for your engagement. And thank you always to our partners at Cantini and our sister leagues. And I also want to do a special thank you to Catherine Franzik. She did an outstanding job, so please give her a round of applause. We do hope to see you Thursday, May 11th at Cantini or online for our civic awareness program, How the World Perceives America, a Global Perspective. Dr. Richard Farkas will be presenting, so please join us next month. And please remember that whether you attend online or you attend in person, you will need to register, so please remember that. And once again, thank you so much, and good night, everyone. Travel safely. <laughs>